Good morning. It is good to be with you in worship on this Lord's Day. And I pray that the God who called you to this place is a God that you meet in a rich and powerful way because I believe God is always calling us to come together so that we might find strength in the community, that we might continue to work and the vision and mission, the idea of putting love first in all things, the, the kind of living that we see in the life of Jesus. And as his disciples, we are called to live such a life. If you are a visitor with us this morning, what a, what a blessing it is to have you as a part of this service. We invite you and, and everyone to take out the blue card from the worship guides this morning to fill that out. Let us know how we can pray for you on the back side. List those prayer concerns and joys. And you'll have an opportunity later in the service at the time for communion to place those in the baskets. Unless you're thinking about joining. And then we say, keep a hold of that blue card and you can give it to me, give it to one of our elders at the close of the service. I also want to lift up um, last Sunday in my sermon, I mentioned commercial cricket farming and people who eat crickets. And because we have some folks in the congregation with a sense of humor, they purchased crickets, salt and vinegar crickets, and I don't know what other flavors. And you can find them over in Holy Grounds right now between the donuts and the granola and other things. If you desire to taste one such cricket, and I am completely serious, I love a congregation with a sense of humor. Uh, that's in assuming that somebody hasn't gone over there and eaten all of them. I want to lift up that Tuesday evening at 645, we're having the adult discipleship meeting. Uh, those that are part of that team come and join in the discussion. If it's something that is of interest to you, want to, want to participate, come and join us over in the activity room on Tuesday night. Wednesday, we have a meeting for the blessing of the animals. We're doing the work in preparation for that wonderful event, the first Sunday of October, or excuse me, first Saturday of October. Uh, that is the time in which we honor St. Francis of Assisi, that wonderful saint that was about the work of God's creation and blessing all things, including animals. And so we have people bring their pets, their cats, their dogs, their snakes, whatever it is for blessing. It is a great day here at the church, but we're going to be working this Wednesday night in preparation for that. I want to welcome back some of our youth who went on the mission trip. We're here this morning at the early service. They've had a great week. But again, I want to thank Kevin and Jennifer Warman. I want to thank Mariah and Josh, who all gave leadership to the mission trip. Um, they do great work. And I know the youth are blessed because of that. We are right now two and a half years into our crossing over campaign. When I got here at Cypress Creek about five years ago, we were, well, we were about $2.7 million in debt. And at that time, we were paying interest only on the debt, on a 20-year mortgage. And I'm not great with math, but if you're paying interest only on a 20-year mortgage, it's no longer a 20-year mortgage. You're extending it out further and further and further. And so we said as a church, it's important for us to do more than just pay the mortgage. And so in two and a half years, we have paid down a million plus dollars on that mortgage. It's the halfway point for our crossing over campaign, but I celebrate God working in our midst. I appreciate and celebrate your generosity, but it wasn't just to pay down our mortgage. There were other little things, but we have 37 air conditioners or something like that on our campus, and we had no plan for replacing them, and most of them were 20, 25, even some of them 30 years old, and so we've been able to replace air conditioning units, get them up to date and to get a plan of replacing, which means we have to replace about one, one and a half air conditioning units in theory every year. And so we're getting better at a routine, a plan of doing that. And that is in part your generosity. 
Why I lift that up today is that the scripture I have chosen for our conversation on baptism and what that means within our tradition, I am drawing upon the passage from the book of Joshua that was the centerpiece for that crossing over campaign. And so I invite you now to hear again those words from Joshua 4. If, if you remember, the Israelites had been in Egypt as slaves. God heard their cries, called forth Moses. God, Moses helped lead them out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, 40 years in the wilderness. And then they get to the Jordan River, the promised land. And they cross over the Jordan. And that's where we pick up the story. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, select 12 people from the community, one from each tribe, and command them to do this. Take 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood, Carry them over with you and lay them down in the place where you will camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the 12 people from the Israelites whom he had appointed, one from each of the tribes. Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan and each of you take up a stone on your shoulder, one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it, was, when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off so that the stones, these stones that sit here, will be a memorial forever. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones, one of the mid, out of the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes in Israel. As the Lord told Joshua, they carried them over to that place where they camped. And they laid them down there. May ancient stories inspire our current living. Inspire our lives for faithfulness and justice and compassion. You pray with me. May we receive your message, God. Your message of grace and forgiveness. May we receive it not as a trickle, not as a drop here or there, but as a deluge that, that you pour over us, that we receive with such power. We offer these words in the name of the triune God. Amen. There is something about water. A number of years ago, my family took a vacation to Colorado. We, were, we, we got a cabin that was in a wonderful valley right alongside a stream for about three days. And the very first morning when I got up, right after sunrise, I went and sat alongside the stream. And I just took in the experience all the wonderful images and sounds and the way that it touched my senses. And I found myself forced to go and touch the water. I was forced to take off my sandals and to put my feet into the cool water. I, I'm hesitant in using the word forced, and yet it's the only way I can describe the allure of the water. There is something about water. My good friend David Merrick, who died a few years ago, he and his wife Carol had a daughter named Lily with Rett syndrome. She developed normally up until the age of two and then stopped her development and even regressed some. She never spoke. She was confined to a wheelchair. Lily would often, as she got older, get frustrated with her inability to communicate, 
to be able to share her emotions, her feelings. And when she would get so anxious about that, David knew there was one thing that would help, and he would take her to a park that was close to their home where there was a pool of water and a fountain that would shoot about 12 to 15 feet in the air. And he and Lily would sit there by the pool, and she was just engrossed by the water and the sound, and the imagery, and the light. She would smile and giggle, and David described it as a source of peace for both of them. There is something about water. In Psalm 78, there is a retelling of the Exodus story but a retelling in more poetic language, the poetry of the Psalms. And it says, the Lord worked marvels in the land of Egypt. The Lord divided the sea and let the people pass through it and made water stand like a heap. The Lord split rocks open in the wilderness and gave the people water abundantly as from the deep. The Lord made streams come out of the rock and cause waters to flow down like a river. The water was a doorway for the people. The water was sustenance for them as they traveled through the desert. The water became for them an image of the power of God that was at work to deliver and to sustain them. Water became an identifying mark in their life together. There is something about water. And in the story that I shared from Joshua, the people 40 years earlier had left Egypt as God liberated them and led them out. God opened up the Red Sea and let them pass through it and enter into the wilderness for 40 years. God didn't leave them alone there. God provided for them water that came up out of the rocks, coming out of that place that no one expected to see water. God sustained them as they were in the wilderness. And then they got to the edge of the promised land, to the land that had been promised to Abraham and Sarah so many years earlier. They stood there and then crossed over the Jordan and to the other side. And God said, send a representative, one from each of the 12 tribes back in to the Jordan to pick up a rock from the riverbed and place it where you will camp tonight. And you can just imagine them stacking those rocks like an altar, a place of remembrance, a place of honor, so that in the years to come when their children and their children's children would ask, so what do those rocks mean? It would be the catalyst for a story. A story not just about crossing the Jordan, but about God's movement with the people from Egypt through the Red Sea out into the wilderness where God provided water and then crossing the Jordan into the promised land. Throughout the story, there's something about water. But let me suggest this morning that most of us in today's world go through life never really appreciating the power and implications of that word, water. Unlike those in the ancient world, we don't appreciate what it meant to have water. We might even say there's nothing special about water. Part of the problem is our easy access to water, and not just in a trickle, not just in a drop here and a drop there, but water that comes to us in abundance. Even in a time of drought here in Texas, our lawns might get a little brown. We might have to cut our showers down by 30 seconds every day to help conserve water, but we don't suffer. We don't know what it's like to go without water. Of course, just a few weeks ago, not far from here, 
10 migrants died in the back of a semi-trailer and dozens others suffered because of the heat and a lack of water. And what I realized is it was hard for us to appreciate, to understand what happened to them. Because for us, water is so accessible. When there was lead that showed up in the Detroit water, I was fascinated how people seemed to have a complete disregard for what was happening. Hearing people interview on the news and discussing it, it was as if they were saying, it's just water. Why can't people get access to it? It should be so simple. We may not understand what it means to have a struggle or difficulty in, in accessing water. But those who wandered in the wilderness, those who came out of Egypt and crossed toward the promised land, they understood water for them was a divine gift of God. But along with being an essential gift for daily living, it represented for them many of the stories of their faith and their faith journey Water not only provided life to the body, but was a living metaphor, a story that carried the people along the journey and gave them a sense of identity. That is important for us to know when centuries later, John the Baptist shows up on the scene. And as Mark's gospel tells it, John appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The Greek word that we translate here as the preposition for, F-O-R, is the Greek word ace. And yes, it could be translated as for, but most often it is translated as into or toward. This word has with it a sense of motion and flow. John is saying this baptism of change moves us toward the release of our sin. There is something that is life-giving about the language that is used here because there is physical motion. It is as if you are getting caught up in the flow of what is happening. And water needed to flow. When you were in the desert, if you came across still waters, they often were stagnant water and poisonous water. You needed water that was moving in the same way that the language of Scripture describes living water. It also was the same language of flowing water. There was movement to it. So when we read that John appeared in the wilderness... The mind should go back to the story of the people in the wilderness. And what we hear about is an experience in the water that moves us, that allows us to get caught up in the flow. It's beautiful imagery. It's storied imagery. Not only was a person surrounded by the water, but surrounded by stories. Our denominational founders spoke about the grace and forgiveness of God that were mediated through baptism. Baptism helped the disciple to enjoy God's gifts of grace and forgiveness, not procure them. Baptism allowed for the disciple to experience these gifts, not to earn them. Baptism allowed for the disciple to get caught up in them, in those gifts, not to obtain them. It was about enjoying, experiencing, and getting caught up in what was revealed in the water. Why baptism? 
because there's so much that is happening in the water. There is something about water. When I was growing up, I would go visit my grandparents out in western Nebraska. And in three of the rooms, three of the bedrooms in their house, you would find a pitcher and basin set. And in the one bedroom that I often stayed in, there was one very similar to this, though the the bowl was slightly smaller. I thought it was just decoration. And but one day I asked my grandmother about the pitcher and basin. And what she told me was a story. Now she was born in 1899. She grew up in western Nebraska. She remembered firsthand the dust bowl. She remembered the clouds of dust moving across the plains. If you had your house shut up, it didn't matter. That dust found its way into your home. She said every morning when it was calm, they would go out to the, to the pump. They didn't have water in the house. And they would fill up the pitcher. They would bring one into each of the bedrooms. They would put over it a cloth. Because as the day progressed, that dust would be everywhere. And she said, you never realized how dirty you were until you took your clothes off. And then there would be a line on your skin wherever your clothes had stopped And you found out just how dirty you were. And she said it was very important at the end of the day to take the pitcher and to pour some water into the bowl and to begin to reach into that clean water to wash your body, to wash your face. But knowing my grandmother, she was a teacher, and she didn't just tell me this story. She went and filled up the pitcher with water, and she poured it into the basin as she told me the story. And just the way she told the story, it was as if I was there. There was something about having her encourage me to touch the water. That that story, decades before I was even born, became a part of my story. There was something about the water that engaged and invited. Will Willimon, Bishop Will Willimon, a bishop in the United Methodist tradition, before he was the bishop, he was the dean of the chapel at Duke University. And one day when he was in the chaplain's office, he received a phone call. It was the father of a student, an irate father. And the first words were, what have you done? Willimon was a little caught off guard. What do you mean? He said, my daughter, who will be graduating this spring with a mechanical engineering degree, has decided that she is going to Haiti to work with the Presbyterian Volunteer volunteer Missionary Group to dig ditches. To which Willimon, trying to be funny, try to break the tension, said, well, I know her well, and she probably wasn't taught how to dig ditches as a mechanical engineer, but she was always a quick learner. I'm sure she'll do very well. Oh, the father did not find that funny. It's your fault, he said. It's your fault. You're the one to which Willimon got very serious and said, no, it is not. Are you not the one that had her baptized? Remembering that in the Methodist and Presbyterian churches, you're baptized as an infant. Were you not the one who took her to Sunday school? Were you not the one who took her to confirmation class where she embraced her baptism? Were you not the one that sent her to church camp? To which the father said, yes, But our intention was to make a good Presbyterian, to which Willimon said, there's your mistake. You had her baptized. And in that experience, you invited her into a story. You gave her an identity. There is something about water. And though we may perform a baptism in our baptistry up there, it's not just about that moment. 
Those waters are more than just the waters that are contained in the baptistry. They are filled with story and imagery. We are invited into that story, into that experience. There is something about touching the waters that allows us to touch the stories of grace and forgiveness. Our denominational founders talked about how baptism and the experiences in the water allow for us to enjoy and encounter and experience and embrace not just that moment, but all the stories. For we are a people that know what it means to wander in the wilderness. We've all had a moment like that. And sometimes those moments have been pretty long. And yet our God comes and helps tell the story of grace and forgiveness. And sometimes all it takes is for us to touch the waters and for our lives to be touched by the waters. You join me in prayer. Water. You have gifted us, O Creator God, with water. It is life-giving, but not only to our bodies, but to our spirits as well. You have gifted us with water, and there is more to it than just, than just liquid. There is story infused in the water. There are images that speak about you. The God who liberated and led, a God that found a way, a God that gave to people in the midst of the deserts of life something to drink. You, God, are the one that has gifted us with water. Allow us to touch the waters. Let us be caught up in the waters. Let us feel the flow of the water and let us realize that in doing so, we are caught up in your grace and your forgiveness. Oh God, you are so generous. And whether it is in the waters of baptism or in just those moments when we encounter or touch or hear the water. May we be reconnected to the multitude of stories in which you saved and transformed and healed people with the waters. May those stories be our stories. May those stories identify us in the name of Jesus the one who is living water to all. Amen.